We call this um, this session uh, Lessons from the Shark Icon and Investor, and we want to know a lot about you, about your career, about your views, and that's what we're going to do in the next hour, and then we will open it up for questions. But just to make it official, allow me to introduce you, please. Uh, so Yasmin Lukacs serves as an executive director of the Israel Collaboration Network, ICON, as you uh, may know, a nonprofit organization that aims to create um, a Silicon Valley-based community to harness and support Israeli startups, technology, and innovation. And I'm waiting to hear more about that. Prior to joining ICON, uh, she was the founder and COO of Evoz, a consumer electronic startup founded Israel Ayom, Israel's, uh, we know that, daily, daily paper, and served um, as chairperson uh, of the board at six, uh, for six years. Uh, after investing in early stage startups, um, such as Ipalti, Trip Actions, and Salt Security, she uh, was picked to start at, uh, of course, uh, Hakrishim, the Shark TV show, uh, Shark Tank, and uh, founded about two years ago, Code uh, for Israel, which we're going to learn more about that, how you take uh, tech volunteers. This bio makes me sound so old. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> tech volunteers movement that works together to solve Israel's main challenges uh, using technology. After this, um, we're going to talk about your journey, about what a shark investor wants, about how to um, penetrate the US market these days for startups, communities, and impact that you're so good at. Um, but to start with, please tell us a bit about yourself. We, you talked a bit about your singing or not non-singing career, but what are your hobbies? What were your dreams going, growing up? And what important for you today? Wow, that's a big question. I'm going to start asking. We want to get to know you. If I forgot <laughs> something, let me know. Um, so I was born and raised in Tel Aviv. Uh, I spent the past uh, 18 years in the U.S. I uh, went there for business school and then decided to stay. Came back here about a year ago. Um, and I'm thrilled about coming back. I'm a mother of four kids. I have two dogs. I'm moving on Sunday, which is really consuming a lot of my free time right now. I said hobbies, so <laughs> I have very good hobbies. Yeah. Um, until COVID, I used to do competitive ballroom dancing. Wow. And then COVID came and there were no more competitions. And then I found myself in like the most uncommon thing. I'm practicing um, um, jiu-jitsu. Which is a wow. Which is a Brazilian martial, you know, martial arts. And yeah. if you don't know what it is, it involves people trying to choke you and trying to break different uh, limbs of your body. Uh, they put all their weight on you. And you know, this week on Tuesday, in my favorite class uh, with Itamal, we learn how to swipe off people when uh, from a butterfly guard. And I find myself on my back with like eighty kilos person on my face, sweaty. Like, why am I doing this? Yeah. <laughs> why, why am I doing this? And I'll tell you why. why? I feel that um, that I I'm, I'm such an underdog when I come there. That I'm I'm weak. I'm a you know I'm weak because I'm a woman. I'm a little older. I'm I'm a beginner. And I, I, I'm amazed by the challenge, by starting and going somewhere when you are uh, most atypical person to, to win. And I'm not winning, and it's also helping with the ego that you're not always yeah. winning. Um, but I'm crazy about it, and I love it. So I really hope everybody has a passion of their own that, that gives me what that gives me. Uh, and then in terms of what I do, other than um, try to choke people <laughs> and break yeah. off their limbs, and move. Um, You're a shark. It's important to know how to battle a bit, right? Yeah, so I'm yeah. on TV on Shark Tank. I did season uh, two and three, and we're going to film season four um, in the coming months, so I'm excited about that. Yeah. Um, I feel season three, that I just finished airing not long ago, um, was different for me. I, I felt like we became more competitive about the investments, and I felt like I'm um, getting used to the medium and I can step uh, step up and bring more of my Silicon Valley experience. I think what um, what kind of brought me to Shark, to the Shark Tank, um, it's not about the specific investment, it's about bringing the Silicon Valley knowledge to everyone that's actually watching at home. Um, there's yeah. a song in Hebrew, Adif, uh, Azolech, so, um, so it's exactly that. And I was hoping people that have ideas and watch the show uh, will get a better understanding uh, of how to do that. So, so I'm doing sharks. I'm doing some VC investments of my own. But I think uh, what matters to me most is uh, impact and, and, and the work I do with Icon and with Code for Israel. And I can dive into explain what each of those does. But I'll tell you before why I think um, 
I care a lot about those things, especially now. Uh, in Stanford, one of our marketing professors, Professor Jennifer Acker, her um, topic, favorite topic of research was happiness. And um, she came to us and presented her research about happiness and what happiness is. And um, she said happiness actually changes with age. And when you're a baby and your diaper is dry and you're fed, you're happy. And in your 20s, uh, excitement makes you happy. And then she moved on through the years and she said, well, in 40, it's impact and community. And I was like, damn it. And uh, it's me. Um, yeah. and, I, and, and I feel that um, actually doing those things that I do make me really happy. Um, if you're curious, when you're 60, it's about peace and quiet. But I'm not okay. there yet. So Still time. So still time. So I do, uh, I do community work. I do impact work uh, most of my time. Uh, oh, maybe because I'm touching this. Yes. Um, and it makes me happy because it is community work, but also because it's on the um, junction of community work and business. Yeah. So ICON, what is ICON? What is ICON? ICON is a nonprofit founded by the Israeli community in Silicon Valley. Uh, we're a community of people that share a passion for Israeli tech and innovation. We want to see Israeli entrepreneurs, like in Bal, succeed in the US just because they're Israelis. Um, and we have uh, all Israeli founders are welcome to join ICON. It's just it's just a form, you know, it's just a form online. And you're welcome to join what we do. We have partners in USBC firms and corporate executives, and through a variety of programs, we create opportunities such as today. It's an it's an opportunity for people to get to know each other. Uh, we pass on knowledge, and uh, we help people try to create their network and um, meet other people over there and learn from other people over there in the U.S. You know That's what I gone. love? I love about, first of all, not only what you're saying, but how you're saying it. It's, it's so clear to see your passion to everything you just mentioned, and I love it. And I think what you said about the, um, uh, the jiu-jitsu and all that, I think it's, and tell me if, if you think otherwise, that it's also support the, the creativity part, because you're doing different things, and eventually I think it all kind of adds up to to be more creative or more diverse, or as you said, maybe be more humble in a way. It's interesting. So um, my ex-husband is an artist, mm -hmm. and my daughter is amazing. She's very talented. Uh, she's an amazing painter, um, draw, and she's drawing amazing things. And I always compared myself to them, and I was like, I'm not creative at all. What mm -hmm. kind of creativity do I have in my head? I'm not creative at all. Okay. But I agree with what you say, and I see, yeah. and especially the people that I see, the entrepreneurs, maybe not the investors, but the entrepreneurs that yeah. come. They are so creative. They have amazing ideas. They have ideas with, um, you know, with what to do with technology, what to do with business plans, and, and etc. I mean, the investors are okay too, uh, <laughs> but there's a lot of creativity that you don't really put. You know, it's not trivial that this is creativity. Yes. So you're surrounded by creativity, basically. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm thrilled. And I'm excited <laughs> about it. So, so we said icon, but uh, we didn't talk about yeah. Code for Israel. So Code for Israel. Yeah is um, as an, another nonprofit that uh, I founded with an amazing group of volunteers about a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and what we do is um, we saw yeah. that, that, why is it making noises? Maybe you should take it out. Maybe you take it out. Yeah. Yeah. Or like, so maybe put it a bit higher. higher. Better? Let's see. Let's OK. So um, good for Israel. So but we, we saw that um, the Israeli high tech is kind of the motor engine behind the Israeli economy. And we said, why wouldn't the high tech be the um, motor engine um, behind everything in Israel, behind um, the social sector, behind all, um, just help Israel um, become a better place. Yeah. And what we actually do is with volunteers from different high tech companies, from startups, we solve um, essential problems uh, in education, in um, health, uh, in Bitron uh, Pnim, in everything that you can think of. And, I know we're going to dive later into code yeah. for Israel, but again, it's another opportunity for impact and business that I'm thrilled about. So the question, my next question would be, what are you most passionate about? Is it the social uh, impact that you're making or the business impact that you're making? If you can choose between I know, I the mean, two. It's easy to choose. Um, I, I don't think there's like a doubt, and I think you can see it from where I talk. Um, mm -hmm. I love the impact. I yeah. love uh, the social work that I do. I think like, if you look at my time and how much time I spent with Icon and with Code for Israel. Hi, Al. Hi. Al. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> How much time I spent with Icon and with Code for Israel versus with, um, yeah. with seeing company for my own investments. I mean, I see many startups for, to help them with Icon. Um, yes, this is, this is what makes me happy. Um, this, is, um, this is why I want to wake up and, and go to work. 
And it's also connected, obviously, like your, your social, like the social activity supports business. If it's, yes. yeah, Code for Israel or, yes. yeah, or yes, ICON. Exactly. I mean, and, you know, at the end yeah. of the day, the investments that, that I made are of startups that I met through ICON. Yeah. Yeah. So it all comes together. And, you know, when you approach an investment, what is your own, I would say, signature thought process? And, and what are you looking for? So I think every, I mean, there are three main buckets in my mind when an investor in general looks at an investment. It's the team, it's the product, and it's the market. Yeah. And um, the balance between those three changes uh, depends on who you are. Uh, it also depends on uh, what stage the startup is. Because if in the beginning, um, the team is really what matters most, because a good team can understand there's a problem and maybe change the product. Later on, when you have a lot of uh, sales, it, it's got to be the market. Yeah. Um, so, um, I like early stage investments, so I focus on the team. Um, I also um, am a big people person and I feel I kind of get a sense. Um, and, um, you know, when I see those entrepreneurs with like the, the glitz in their eyes, yeah. um, they're giving like years of their life to, to do something um, yeah. and, and I enjoy that. So, for me, the team yeah. uh, is the most important thing when I'm looking at an investment. I want to see people that have um, kind of shared values. Of what I do, I mean, of course, you want to see yeah. a great idea yeah. and a great team um, that can execute on the great idea. Yeah, but yeah. you're looking for the spark in the eyes and the the passion and and the, the great excitement. idea. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course, something that ROI eventually. I mean, as you know, important. everything. You know, just a great okay. team is not enough if the idea is horrible and a, yeah. great, and a horrible idea. I mean, and a great idea is not going to work with the with the wrong yeah. team. It's got to be a fit. It's got to work together. Exactly. As long as it's good. So my question would be, um, how do you see the current economic crisis? From how does it impact the way you invest? And what are your recommendations for startups during such times? So I'm glad that you asked, um, yeah. you know, what, what I think about the current crisis. Because I've been asked, is there a crisis? And I think that's a very, um, that's yeah. a very naive question to ask. Because uh, there is a crisis. Yeah. What started in the public market and trickled down to all the other markets. Um, and what was your question? What was yes. my recommendation for startups? Yeah. So how do you think, how does it impact your investment and what would be your recommendations for startups? So when I look at a startup now, I'm a little more careful in evaluating everything. Um, the profitability or potential profitability is important. Uh, well, I think a while ago, we mostly investors um, were looking at um, just growth. Uh, now we want to see um, profitability. My daughter and her friends have a WhatsApp group called Anishtodarim mm Bachrayut. -hmm. For those who understand uh, Hebrew, and I think this is yeah. exactly what it is now. So we want to see you grow, uh, but uh, responsibly, yeah. responsibly growth. What? Um, so I'm a little more careful when I make investment decisions. Yeah. What I see, and I see other investors doing the same. I hear some investors say we didn't change anything, uh, and some are actually waiting. We had a panel in Icon. We have a conference uh, every September. And there actually was an amazing panel about the current investment climate with um, three investors from like top tier VCs in the US. Yeah. And they all said, well, no, nothing changed, nothing changed, nothing changed, yes. And then the moderator goes, well, how many investments did you make this year? He says, um, one. And then the other one, uh, none. And then the other one, uh, none. So maybe, you know, you think things didn't change, but investors are more careful when they make yeah. decisions. Well, we, um, recommend startups to do is um, you know be prepared for that um, yeah. also because everyone is careful but you know there's an expectation of valuation to go now so if someone has raised with a very high valuation that's that can't be supported now I think they have to be um, tolerant for a down round um, I think if you don't have to raise money now you can push it um, maybe um, you know just burn less, yeah. figure out how to burn less, uh, which is always a good thing, uh, and try to get forward. It, is, it does warn me that eventually, if everybody does that in six months, in a year, even those companies that extend the run will have to raise money, yeah. and 
what's going to happen. But at the same time, if investors are not investing as much, there is going to be, I mean, there's going to be a good time. Yeah. So after a bad time comes a good time. So, so if you don't, my recommendation, if you don't need to raise now, wait a few months, um, make yourself look better with the numbers and with everything, have a strong case. Why, um, why investors should invest in you. And um, if you're raised in a very high valuation, uh, put the ego aside and understand the market has changed. Mm -hmm. And as you said, what goes down will go up, but we hope it will go up in a reasonable timing for, for them as well. Um, now, we watch, uh, we, we, see, we see you obviously uh, um, not accepting uh, different startups on the sharks, on the shark tank, but if you can recall a very positive uh, founder pitch and share with us what they did good. Let's kind of analyze the successes. In shark tank or in general? In general, in, in general. general. I think when, uh, I, I mean, for once, you know, the product speaks, you, you gotta let the numbers speak for you. So there's one entrepreneur that came and spoke about uh, 100,000 users to his product with no funds raised at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you see such an amazing success, you know, this, it's really hard to yeah. say, like, everybody like, what, what, what did he say? Did he say he didn't raise anything? Like, oh, everybody wanted to yeah. hear more about what he says uh, and how he did that. And, and it was interesting. Um, and there are many other hooks that you can use. Maybe you raise from an amazing fund in the beginning. Maybe yeah. you have like an employee that's really amazing. So you want to like start with the hook that gets, um, the attention of the people that are watching. I think another thing that I like uh, when I hear um, founders speak is when they really understand um, what they do in the market. Um, you know, they know who the competitors are, they know how they're better than the competitors or how they're different than the competitors, hopefully better too. They don't bad mouth the competition. I think there's also a mistake that many people just out there, not but nobody, you know, they're buying that while they actually have a lot of sales. Yeah. So that. Um, I also think that good um, good entrepreneurs know how to tailor their pitch to who they're sitting in front of. So I'm not a technical person. Yeah. Um, so maybe it require a little bit of more, or we just assume we're not going into anything technical. We're just going to talk about the business case. But when you have technical people in front of you, maybe you do have to dive a little deeper into that. Um, and I think then there's a challenge of how do you explain complicated technology to people mm -hmm. who don't understand technology. So I like to see entrepreneurs. They know how to present, they speak nice, you know, that they're coherent, uh, and they speak nicely, they know what they're doing, they have the numbers uh, and the facts to support them, everything is amazing, and they actually don't need my money. Uh, and I want to ask them, you know, please, yeah, please, let me, <laughs> let me, please, yes. But I like what you said about the hook, because, you know, I, I find, um, I would say, a good amount of, of founders, maybe usually in the first startup, that they don't share sometimes a very important um, point about themselves, for example, that it's not their first startup or, uh, you know, different details that could support their, their case, as you said, so. And not just about that, I think many people, if they think there's something that might actually hurt their, pro their, their case, yeah. they don't talk about it, and I think that's really bad, because eventually it's going to come out, and yeah. then um, the investor's going to think if you're trying to hide something or not being honest, and for me, if something, if I have even the slightest suspicion there's something fishy, if someone's not honest, I'm just going to walk away. Yeah. Yeah. So just talk about everything. You know, if you and your um, co-founder share the same last name, I'm going to... Yeah. <laughs> Assume. I mean, you know, call it, maybe if it's Cohen, you say, you know, we have the same last name, but we're not siblings, we're not married, we're not related at all. It's just a coincidence. But, um, but you should, but even if you don't and you are related to someone, you should just say, yeah. say everything. Thank you for that. Now, I know um, you do a lot of, uh, of diversity. You have a, a woman, a women uh, also a, a program, I would say, at ICON. And um, if, I'll go, if I'll go to the numbers by the Israel Innovation Authority, Women in High Tech Report in 2022, they said that only 4% of the investment funds are allocated uh, to women-led startups. Now, do you see any improvement in the trend? Again, it's a harsh time, but do you see any movement from that? Uh, and what do you suggest doing as in the tech, as a tech ecosystem as a whole to influence it from your perspective and impact? I see a movement in the awareness that, that we have a problem, yeah. um, and I'd love to see I'd love to see more women entrepreneurs, more female entrepreneurs. Um, yeah. Even just for you know, forget about how that it's it's a good uh, moral thing. It's just a better business case. You want to have diversity in everything that you do. Um, at Icon, we do have a women in tech. We have a women in tech program. 
Uh, we make it our business to always put women on stage when there's a panel, to create many role models uh, in everything that we do. Uh, but at the same time, we're not going to uh, like promote someone or put someone in a program just because she's a woman. I think it's not good for the woman or for someone else. Yeah. Uh, luckily, we don't need to do that because there's so many uh, amazing and uh, successful women entrepreneurs that are there. Um, and we get them. It's just a lot, a lot more work for us yeah. to go and find them. Still, we don't, we don't get to fifty percent. Yeah. Um, if you know amazing female entrepreneurs, let us know about them. If you know someone who's debating, yes, okay, good, hi. Uh, <laughs> let us know about them. That, and, you know, you, you can find those programs. But I think it's everybody's responsibility to um, to make this ecosystem. Uh, you know, more friendly uh, or better, or to give more opportunities, or to help someone when you can. I mean, not just for the not just for the female entrepreneurs for everyone, yeah. but that is specifically important. Yes, because it's not only about female entrepreneurs. You also support Orthodox and uh, different uh, I mean, diversity and inclusion. You really take took it uh, as a mission at Icon, as, as far as I know and see. Yes, we yeah. speak. Um, I went to speak a few times in, with Comatech yeah, uh, so when they have the. Did this? Uh, what's the name of this? Um, um, the sign for you. Yeah, the, yeah. No, the who was that? The Yeah, the yes. I have one. It's actually really cool. Uh, it's an incentive to go speak there. You exactly. Um, <laughs> and so I spoke there. Oh, and if you actually have to go there, I warn you: don't eat shun. It's very don't eat challenging. <laughs> First day at midnight. Why do you want to eat shun at midnight? Is it, a, is it an exam in order for them to invest in you? You have to make sure that you eat the whole chun plate and then yeah. they invest in you? That's, that's how it goes? I would. It was really yummy. <laughs> they took me on a tour to see the Neymar and that was actually amazing to see. Um, so it felt like going on another planet, how people did their own thing then. Then what I know, it was really eye-opening. And then came the chun at midnight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, we, we make it our okay. I mean, yes, not just women. Uh, yeah. We speak with uh, Israeli Arabs, accelerators, and uh, with ultra Orthodox, with women, and we'd love to see more diversity in everything that we do. Unfortunately, there's not enough. There's just not enough. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I'm going, going back to Icon. So, what you're doing basically is you create events, you have programs, you basically connect the industry, investors, companies. Uh, in the U.S. with Israeli startups, and you creating this pad for them to meet, to um, initiate kind of relationship, and then they need to go on their own. Now, I, I come from the world of, of business communication, of networking, um, and I wonder how you see it. So, how would they? How? What are the the tips or mis common mistakes for them to take this initial initial connection and? and turn it into a business or investment or whatever. So basically, what mistakes do entrepreneurs make uh, while networking? Yeah. Or how, how, yeah, how you suggest them to take it to the next level? Yeah, I think, um, I think most of the mistakes I see uh, mm -hmm. stem from, the, from yeah. cultural differences, from the fact that we yeah. take the Israeli entrepreneurs and we bring them to the U.S. Um, I thought once that we could do like a stand-up about this. Um, yeah. Yes. Um, so I'll try to give you a few examples. One is just like a language thing that uh, people don't understand, or cultural language thing. So if I uh, if I met you and I said let's do lunch, you probably think I want to have lunch with you. Um, in the U.S., it's not yeah. true. It means I don't want to see you again. If I want to have lunch with you, I was like let's do lunch. How about Monday at two? Yeah. Um, and uh, and that's important. Uh, I saw an entrepreneur come out of a board meeting. Is it? Uh, oh, this uh, investor said, maybe I should be looking at another option. Well, maybe I should be looking at another option, but maybe I should not. Well, it's like, no. He said, maybe you should look at another option. He doesn't think you're doing the right thing. You shouldn't do what you're doing. So I, I see people nodding. I don't know if you have experience living in the U.S. and you feel that. And uh, it's not just the language barrier. It's a culture, uh, cultural barrier. On top of that, um, I see many people think that uh, what we call their chutzpah, um, which is good, like, um, <laughs> sometimes uh, could, be, um, could be interpreted as, as pushing uh, when it's too much. Yeah. Um, though many people do appreciate it, I was like I said, and I've been stabbing in the front and I've been stabbing in the front and I'm in the back. Yeah. Uh, so there are things to say about that too. So I think a lot of cultural differences. I also see people, um, actually I had that today, people make mistakes with uh, the expectations. So... Um, with the expectation of what will other people do with them. So let's, let's say I've never met you, yeah. uh, and I see that you are in this event, and um, I see sometimes people think that it's okay to write to you an email and says, hey, 
you know, with this event and uh, I'm looking for someone to recommend my startup to a competition and could you recommend it? And, um, yeah. and it doesn't work like this because your name and your reputation are extremely important in, in communities and I wouldn't put my name behind someone I actually don't know um, or believe in. So I see many people uh, make mistakes about that. I see people make mistakes about um, time to follow up. I think that this in Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. uh, if, say if I connected you with Inval and you wanted to make Inval, and I made the email, you should be answering relatively quickly, I would say 24 hours. Uh, say thank you for the introduction, in Val, let's continue moving you to BCC, I'll continue with Inval directly. And I see people like, two weeks later, oh yeah, thank you for the introduction, yeah. or waiting for the other person to write. And um, this is kind of um, how you do business. I remember our attorney in, uh, uh, in, in Silicon Valley, I mean Akira, she, if she went to like a six hour board meeting, she put an out of office auto reply on her email. Wow. Because the expectation was that you dare and you dare for a client. So maybe that's a service provider and that's different, yeah. but things work quickly. And uh, another mistake is not understanding that there's a rhythm and who's supposed to say thank you and when you're supposed yeah. to do that. So, and they actually another mistake that I, so I don't know if I should talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> Anonymize it. Uh, of course, I want to go. Of course. <laughs> so, without names. Without names. Without names. So, um, so, Moshe. So, <laughs> I, I, um, so, I think there's like some of, um, anecdotes about how to behave yeah. in an office environment and what's appropriate and what's not appropriate to do in an office environment. And uh, I met someone here, and um, he said that he really finds the Silicon Valley. Um, Curious and he doesn't think he understands the culture over there. And yeah. the before that, when he came, he was um, uh, he was doing some things that both me and my colleague felt are very inappropriate in yeah. a work environment with one of his colleagues. And uh, I actually told him, I was like, you know, this is very inappropriate in Silicon yeah. Valley. So you gotta understand also the, the how things uh, how things. What work did well. he do? <laughs> <laughs> but I do think that you know nobody teaches us how to. No, we, we usually also, as a culture, we're, we're, we're saying what we think, you know, we have this chutzpah, and let alone when it comes to communicating with, with the U.S., and you're saying there is a certain rule and pace, and we don't really know that unless, you know, we live there, or well, we, we try, icon. or we learn, exactly, count to icons, so do we, do we get it in icon? Yeah, so um, <laughs> when people come over there, yeah. yeah, we'll talk about that, we do some workshops, and you, you follow what other people do when you get a chance to ask questions, and we yeah. also do something we call the grill, when entrepreneurs can actually present to American investors, mm -hmm. uh, and we frame it as a game, so yeah. we ask the American investors, uh, why won't you, um, you know, you got to give the honest feedback, you say, because usually they'll say, oh, it's interesting, which yeah. means that it wasn't interesting, yeah. but they're not going to give you any useful feedback. And when we frame it as a game, it's like, oh, okay, you want to know what we didn't mm -hmm. like. So we didn't like this, and we didn't like this, and we didn't. And, and, and so you, we create opportunities um, to try things uh, and, and, and do them. And I think that feedback is so important. You know, I've been working with startups, and I have this uh, story that I, I saw this investor in um, at the stock, at the um, um, trade, whatever, forget, forgot the name, never mind. And, and he was kind enough to tell me why he, didn't, he will, will never invest in us. And I don't see many cases where investors do give you this feedback. So if, if this is one of the opportunities that you give, I think it's it's a it's a sheer uh, you know. And also think this is part of being a close knit community. Yeah. Um, of, of from other people, you can say, oh, you know, I want to practice. Can we, you know, can I stay for a few minutes and we we'll practice the beach together yeah. and tell me what you think? So you can get it not just from investors, from other entrepreneurs, um, and 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 learn and continue. Yeah. Thank you. And about uh, when it comes to, again, I'm going back to, to the market and, and B2B. I know some of you here are, are salespeople and you're selling to the U.S. market. Um, is there any, any tip that you can give when, you know, understanding the, the U.S. climate, uh, corporate climate at the moment when it comes to selling to corporations in the U.S. these days? I think what every salesperson knows is you kind of understand what they want. Uh, yeah. One of our mentors, we talked about the sales marketing, you can see founder, co-founder of Soul Security, a cybersecurity startup. He's uh, mentoring everyone on sales, the founders on sales. Um, and he's like, his phrase is like, I'm just curious. So about everything, I'm just curious. Who makes the budget decisions? I'm just curious. What is your current problem? I'm just curious. So everything is just curious. And, yeah. and then we have another mentor, Omer Abin, whose friend is like, channel, channel or another day. You always want to learn. So I think uh, salespeople are very, you should be very curious, or at least pretend to be, and ask a lot of questions. 
a good sales meeting is when you don't say much about the product and you just learn um, about that other person. You want to understand who is making the decisions in a company. You don't want to spend um, time with the wrong person. Uh, who controls the budget and who controls the decision. Hopefully it's the same person. So there's a lot to learn from uh, the founders and everything. But just, um, you say US, but also it's not. It's, it's, it's not New York is not the same as yeah. in Kampani, as in Boston, as in Texas. So you got to understand also um, that there are differences there. Yeah. I think this is why many, many Israeli founders seek um, US experienced or based um, salespeople when they start expanding. Yeah. So they, they better take a, a local person who understands the, the state, the region, the culture, the, the language. Not just that, but also yeah. has uh, connections within the industry. Yeah, the network. Yes, yeah, definitely. Um, moving on to Code for Israel. Now, I, if you don't mind, I'll just read the numbers because, again, you said it was founded a year and a half ago. Um, and as you said, it's about solving social problems through technology, social problems in Israel. And when it comes to the numbers, so it's, they have about 410 volunteers, 20 projects already, 25 social bodies involved, and over 40k hours of volunteering uh, that really makes a difference. So if you can share with us more about the impact, and even if there is a specific project that is near and dear to you out of those uh, tens of projects. I feel like, you know, like... Like you're asking like a mom to, to talk about how the kids did well in class. Yeah. I'm really I'm happy. I'm excited to talk about this. Straight um, A's. Straight A's. They're doing really well. Yeah. Um, so, so as I said before, um, Code for Israel, uh, which I would love to say was our idea, but we actually took a model that exists in the U.S. It's called Code for America. There's also Code for India. We tried to adapt it to the local market. And the idea is here that there's so much knowledge and amazing people. I mean, look around the room. There's really great people here. And I'm sure you're doing amazing things. Um, but those are things that, that go to solve problems in corporations around the world. Uh, and why don't we take all this, these abilities and this knowledge and yeah. solve like main problems here where we live and, and where we, you know, in place we care about the most. Um, and, uh, and that's what we're doing in Code for Israel. So with the volunteers, we have 20 projects um, in different fields. And um, one example, we're working... Um, we started in the off with the education administration in the city. I'm not used to speaking about this in English. Let's see if I can translate it yeah. <laughs> in my mind. Um, and with the city of Naria, and um, they kind of presented a problem. They said the teachers, um, especially with COVID when kids were on Zoom, we don't know what's the mental status of the kids. Who's depressed, who's happy, what's how the class as a whole. Yeah. And what our volunteers created is like a, a little game that the kids play for five minutes twice a week. Within the game pops up questions that were created by educators, and that gives the teachers um, kind of an index on what's the social uh, or emotional well-being of the class as a whole. If there's a specific student they should be, um, you know, looking at. Um, this is deployed in Aria now uh, as a pilot in four classes in third grade and fourth grade. Um, and once we finish the pilot, we're going to go expand it. And you know, hopefully, we're going to give this to every city. Because uh, what the Ministry of Education, the education is giving them now is a pen and paper um, questionnaire once in the beginning of the year. So yeah. think about simple technology. Another project mm -hmm. uh, is with the uh, issue of about speeding processes of um, um, Jesus, of uh, biopsies, mm -hmm. uh, of biopsies and uh, scanning the biopsies. We work with the yeah. Israel in terms of uh, um, food. Um, mm -hmm. On uh, create a volunteer created an algorithm that can analyze uh, satellite images. And tell them when to go to each agriculture, um, wow. to, to each farm. Because what happens is the volunteers would come and would be either too late or too early. Yeah. What that is that does is they take uh, products that um, are not needed or yeah. uh, like uh, leftovers or don't look good, and they use it and they give it for people that need that. But you gotta come at the right time. And um, one of the projects I love talking about the most, and I don't know why. I think maybe because they took me to see it. It was the first project I actually saw implemented. Is a project we did with the Shomer Hadash. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. Um, Shomer Hadash, for those who don't know, is a nonprofit that helps, among many other things, helps um, uh, farmers uh, in the periphery uh, fight agricultural crimes. And uh, what our volunteers, and, and the problem was that the volunteers can't be anywhere all the time. And what we created the volunteers, those sensors that are put uh, in strategic uh, roads. And that can identify if there's a car uh, driving through, and is this a car of uh, like of 
the person who owns the field, or is is it a car, or is it a pig, um, and what are, you know what they want to do. So then the volunteers get a targeted call. We also they um, while working on this, they also understood this another issue, which is theft of um, cattle, okay. on cows. That's mm -hmm. cattle. We say cattle, but cows. Yeah. Uh, and they created kind of a GPS for cows. It's like a little thing they wear um, on the car, and the farmer knows if somebody's trying to steal a cow and wear on the cows. So these are amazing initiatives, obviously for Israel, but also s technologies that could be at some point even ex be exported abroad. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, that's yeah. not maybe the main goal, but obviously it sounds so yeah, yeah. rational. Yeah. You know, I think there are many, you know, if you put my, put my investor on it, yeah. and I'm like, is a GPS for cows a good idea? I, I mean, I don't know. It's, Got to see what do you really do? You really need to yeah. know where they are. Can you improve what they're eating? Uh, do you yeah. need that? There are many business questions, but for sure, here when you want to make a work uh, of volunteers uh, better, it, it does what it does. So I'm thrilled about Cut for Israel just because we have a diversity of of, um, yeah. of projects and uh, because uh, our volunteers are thrilled about it. So yeah. we have um, like tens of volunteers that are joining every week. So we actually had to add more and more projects. <laughs> And uh, it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a good problem. It's a good, it's a good problem. <laughs> yeah. And um, and I'm thinking, I mean, people volunteer. So why won't you volunteer when the impact on your time, I mean, with your time, is the best? Can we suggest projects? Can, can are you so yeah. accepting projects? So sure. So wait a second. Yeah. Wait a second. Maybe. Okay. The microphone. Okay. It's getting... okay. Will I remain? Okay. No, it's okay. it's fine. Can you speak for us? Yes. Okay. Oh. So we can like switching between uh, and switching on that. and off, okay? Okay. okay. So um, yeah, so the, the, we work with the Kol Kore. We say uh, any nonprofit, any social organization that wants to that have a problem, please submit your problems by a certain date. Yeah. Then actually, our volunteers mm -hmm. choose uh, the problems they want to work on. And okay. first, we uh, help with you know we screen the problems. We help some of them um, work on the problem a little bit, and then we choose the projects we you know we want to work on. So. We plan to do it after a year, but we did it after a little less than that, just because we had yeah. more volunteers than we expected. So yes, stay tuned. That's great. Yeah, stay tuned and follow and follow up if you have any uh, ideas for that. Now, um, you know, when I told my father that I'm going to interview you, he said, you know, she loves dogs so much. Like, you know, people know things about you, obviously, from the show, because there was one time a startup with a, a dog-related product. Um, but apart from, I would say, your hobbies and, and things that you love and being a mom and business and impact, um, I think it's like the million-dollar question would be, how do you manage everything? What would be your, you know, your formula to managing all amazing hobbies and life uh, endeavors? There's All together. Really, there's an implicit <laughs> assumption here that I actually balance. <laughs> I don't know, I'm asking. Everybody, I think everybody has their own formula, right? I don't think I'm balancing well. Uh, I, think I, could do, <laughs> I think I could do better. I think um, what works for me, one, yeah. is um, um, relying on amazing people. So I have great people um, that run for Israel, that run Icon, uh, that are involved in everything that I do. Yeah. So I think that is something that is important for everyone to and also understand what do you have to do yourself and what do you outsource? Um, I can outsource someone um, you know, helping me with the laundry, uh, but I want to spend the time with the kids. So um, you prioritize and you do it. And I think also an understanding that you could always do more of any single given item on the things that you have. Mm -hmm. And you got to choose what are the big stones that, that, that's got to be there. Um, and don't move them and keep them. If it's a date night or if it's time to do my nails or yeah. if there's like time, you know, uh, so I'll tell you a story. Um, the fa the um, CEO of YouTube, Susan, her son and my daughter were in a class together, so we were friends. Mm -hmm. And um, then she's like, "Let's do coffee." And I was like, "Okay, well, she said, let's do. Well, how about Monday, 10 a.m. at Starbucks?" So we're sitting and it's Starbucks and like uh, two yoga moms and talking. I'm like, "You know, you're the freaking CEO of YouTube. How the hell do you have time to have coffee, coffee with your friend at 10 a.m. on Monday?" And she told me. Um, I just understood what, I, and I think I tried to follow her advice. She says, I understood what are my essential blocks, and I want to have an hour with my friends. So maybe it's just one hour a week, and next week it's going to be someone else, and next week it's going to be someone else. But I identified that this is important for me. Yeah. So every Monday at 10 or whenever I move it to, I'm going to just be devoted to that one thing. I don't want to wake up in five years long. I was like, oh, wow, my friends were so important for me, and I, I, I don't have time to, to them, yeah. you know, for them at all. So I guess I do balance somehow. Am I happy with my balance? No, but am I okay with the fact that I'm not happy with my balance? Yes. 
I like what you said about the blocks. I think it's really, uh, it's really important to, yeah, as you said, not to wake up five years from now and say, damn it, I haven't, you know, spent much time. I really, I really connect to that. You know, to say that nobody like what uh, about the dance is, damn it, I should have yeah. worked harder. So, exactly. I should have done more things that I love. And speaking of things that you love, before we're going to move to your questions. So, obviously, it's easy to see that you're so passionate about what you're doing and you're doing great things that impact more and more people. What is your next passion project? What do you see your next, uh, the well, next thing that will make your heart sing like that? What should it be? I don't know. Do you have an idea for me? Maybe do you have some, uh, yeah? Politics. <laughs> Politics? Singing. So, singing. <laughs> singing. Okay, for, for sure it's not going to be singing, <laughs> even though I just celebrated a big birthday a few months ago and I did get a gift of like a five uh, Pituach Call lessons. Oh. Uh, I don't know if it's a hint that it's really bad that I shouldn't be trying, but I didn't go yet, so I'll see if I have time to go because it wasn't one of the blocks, it wasn't that, that important. Somebody but. believes in you. Yeah. <laughs> it was my ex husband. <laughs> I'm not going to be a good singer, and I'm 100% fine with that. Maybe I can sing without people running away. That would be like something to uh, a realistic goal. Uh, what is my next? What is my next thing? So my daughter, who um, actually yesterday went on her post-army trip to South America, yeah, for six months, uh, was here with Bodedet when she was here. We didn't, yeah, a lone soldier, someone without a um, uh, without a family here, and. Um, um, and that kind of made me think about all the problems that Khalid Bouddhim has uh, and yeah. working around um, that uh, world right now about some new ideas. But I'm open yeah. to hear what, you know, come talk to me. I'm open to hear about what you think. Thank you. Sure. Okay, so um, let's move to you guys. What are your questions to ask me? Hmm. Yeah, name and question. Hi, Ron. Just mentioned about the uh, uh, culture differences between us and the Americans. I, I figure out myself the, the <laughs> issues. This way, for example, uh, when I have like an uh, elegant uh, shirt, I need to put it in the pants and things like that. So now Israeli are looking at me and say, why, why it's in the pants? Who's with that? So get used to it. Uh, anyway, um, for doing business today, <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, actually, there is kind of a or something like this because there are some very specific things and tricks that you can ask and get the feedback and understand exactly if somebody say oh it's very interesting probably it's not interesting at all so do you know any kind of maybe a YouTube channel something with a little bit uh, laugh about it or something else that we can use as an entrepreneur so I'll just repeat to make sure everybody heard so Ron says is there is there any uh, manual for knowing how to uh, manage the cultural differences between Israel and Americans I think it's a great question. So um, I really believe in uh, like those YouTube videos and, and stuff like this. I think it's a great way to um, language, to make information accessible. We actually created an iPad series of movies, not about that. It's called The Next yeah. Exit. We just it's released great. that. It's a series of 10, uh, three, four minute uh, videos that explain to people that uh, how to start a startup, what's important, like tips from people in the industry. You can find it in uh, Icon's YouTube channel, and I recommend it. But I think it's a good idea. Maybe we should do something around. We should do something around that too. I'm sure if you Google, there's a lot of uh, posts about it. Uh, but I don't know of any like manual that does everything. Uh, if you find it, I'm sure they have a Facebook page and post it what you have. But if there's nothing good, we'll um, we'll think about it. We'll try to do something. Yeah, I'm challenging you. Maybe we can do something. <laughs> right. Well, they actually had a really good uh, series with uh, Noah Zilberman. Yeah. He's also a. Uh, an amazing uh, that's, young the, that's the one I'm talking yeah. about, the next exit. The next yes. exit, yeah, so no, that's on YouTube. And also for your question, there is a book called Israeli Business Culture. A woman called Snat, um, I forgot her last name at the moment, uh, she created this, she, re, she basically interviewed about 300 expats and she created this manual how should we uh, communicate with people from America, from the Europe, um, Asia and so on, of Snat Lautman. So uh, look for that book. Next question. Name and your question. Hey, I'm Gilly. Nice to meet you. Um, my question is around the US and China trade war. Do you think some startups, new startups, can gain something from this kind of thing? In what way? And what do you think about that? So, if startups, what startups can gain from? From the US China trade war. From the US China trade war. Interesting question. Maybe it's always startup. Cool. 
Congrats on the sale. Um, I know nothing about this. <laughs> I don't know about, uh, about the relationship between Israel. I gotta say, more than 90% of the startups, of the technological startups that we work with, want to succeed in the US. Uh, maybe because it's early stage, and we talked earlier that want to first convert the US market, which is, I guess, easier than the European market because tech, you know, um, Texas is more similar to California than Germany to France. Um, and so we work, um, you know, we're based in the U.S., we work in the U.S., I understand U.S. culture and what's happening over there, the relationship between the U.S. and Israel, but I don't have, a, maybe someone else want to ask a question, any information about China. I can only say she she, ni hao, more than that. Not even that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Any next question? Yeah. Can you say something about who was your inspiration and is it still the same people? Danny asks, who's your inspiration? Is it, and is it still the same people than it used to be before? Um, like public figures? I guess not. Yeah, it's, it's, um, my mom and my daughter, I guess, yeah. in different yeah. ways. Yeah. yeah, my mom and, and my grandpa. Um, I guess I'm a family kind of person. Um, yeah, I, each of them I admire for different things that they do, for the strength, for their resilience, for their... Um, standing on their own for their choices. Um, my grandfather I just missed was my best friend. So mm. sorry. And, and you grew up in Tel Aviv, right? I grew up born in Tel Aviv. I grew up here in Tel Aviv. Yeah, I grew up here. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. Yes, a bit. Hi. Um, I also. Uh, okay, I'm just. Yeah. The dog just had a shot, so he's a bit. Yeah. He's one. Can. He was in the house, and he I'm also born and raised in Tel Aviv. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to ask you, what was the biggest challenge that you had throughout your career? So Sapir asked, what was your biggest challenge throughout your career? I hope it's still ahead of me. Um, <laughs> I hope it's still ahead of me. So what was my biggest challenge? Um, I think mostly internal, um, there was a time, I mean, I started, my career was very diverse, um, and Steve Jobs says you can only connect the dots looking backwards, so now I can see how everything that I've done brought me to where I am today, but there was a time that I was like, what's the relationship between, um, you know, working for Ernst & Young and doing valuations of team and Banco Poalim, to working on an event company, to, to doing a newspaper, and, and I... I was like, I'm, maybe I'm lost. And um, I think my biggest challenge was kind of understanding what I want to do and finding my spot. But I, I honestly, I really hope the biggest challenges are ahead of me and that I'm better equipped to deal with them than I was 20 years ago. I just saw an interview with you. Yeah, please. please. I just saw an interview with you. Uh, I think it's a Shvua Nara last year, and you said the beautiful thing about, about failure, that you wish everybody would, would fail, because that like builds you so much for, for the next challenge or for the next thing, so. Um, yeah, I think, I, yeah. I don't know what I said there specifically, but I'd love to quote um, a skier called Johnny Mosley that came to speak in one of our events, and he's a freestyle skier, and freestyle skiing, it's uh, about moguls and jumps. Um, and he said that the first rule of freestyle skiing is a fall is not a fall unless you come to a complete stop. And I was like, wow, that's so true in business. Um, you, you fail, it, does, it doesn't stop you. It's actually not a fall, it's not a failure. Uh, and when I, I get asked a lot about my failures, and yeah. it's like, well, I don't think that I didn't fail, but I don't think I perceived my failures as failures because I perceived them as yeah. a learning opportunity. So I wish for everyone to be more, um, to think of Johnny mostly and to know that when you fall, it's not a fall unless you make a complete stop. So just keep on rolling and keep on going until you stand up again and you get and you do the jump again and just make sure you learn from your uh, almost fall. So sometimes you win, sometimes you learn, as they say. Amazing, nice. yes, I'm gonna quote you on that. Thank you, it's not my quote, but you can, you can <laughs> say it was me. <laughs> yes. Hi, I'm from Spotlight. Uh, we're investing in uh, medical, microphone for uh, medical. My question is what's the thing the next trends in uh, as far as Silicon Valley for investing, and what's your specific areas of investment? So the next trends in Silicon Valley for investment is investment and your specific area of investing. Yes. So I think that many times when you, I think COVID did a lot of things with health. I mean, brought a lot of attention to health. 
I think now we're seeing um, a lot of attention towards new technologies that bring new things, um, such as GPT-3 and everything that around AI, and things that blockchain brings to the table, which specifically I'm not as interested in, like personally. Um, but I think you want to see what, where the technologies go and what takes you to the future. I think um, there's some verticals that are always going to be there. Uh, developer tools, things that make the developer's life easier. Um, cybersecurity, which is really very strong. Um, personally, I invest, uh, I invest in people. So it might be something I'm, I wouldn't usually um, invest in, but uh, usually I invest in B2B software, personally. I usually invest in B2B software. Uh, Icon specifically does everything. Everything we will have consumer startups and things in life science and 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 then you know and crazy AI stuff and uh, everything. Thank you. Yeah. Next question. Yes. I think I heard you. Dorit said, "What is your main tip for women entrepreneurs?" That was your question. Um, to just do that, um, I, you know, it's like if we don't do, we just gonna fail 100%. Like I started with the song that thankfully I didn't sing. I did "Kishalom uh, Mefuar," <laughs> "Kishalom Bamegra," and dare and do. Um, I I used to speak in admission events for Stanford, and I used to say, "I promise you that if you don't apply, you're not gonna get in." Because the yeah. problem that we had is that many women didn't even apply. It's like, oh, we're not going to make it, so we're not mm -hmm. going to even apply. So understanding that some women have a bias towards um, not acting on their dreams and, and be less judgmental um, and, and just go quickly, try, and if it doesn't work, change. I also think that um, I don't like using the fact that I'm a woman in business. I want to look at myself and treat myself exactly like someone else. I got, um, I, I got a female entrepreneur called me once and said, I want your advice. Like, okay, she said, well, when I go with clients to have beer at night, um, my, uh, my spouse is not happy about this. How do you deal with the spouse? I was like, well, why do you go to have beer with the customer at night? Like, I don't want to go have a beer with the customer at night. I want to go with my friends to have a beer at night. And she goes, well, honestly, I think the more uh, inclined to listen to me um, because, you know, uh, we go out to a bar. And I was like, I don't like that. I don't like that. You can't, um, I mean, you can you do whatever you want, but... Don't, um, you know, just be like, let the product talk for you. Let the product do the sale, not the fact that you're a woman. Thank you. Any other question? Yes? How is it possible to join uh, Code for Israel as a volunteer? And your name? Maria. Maria, how is it possible to join Code for Israel as a volunteer? Great question. So um, just go to codeforisrael.org. And put your name in there. I want to volunteer, and someone uh, from our community, Dina, is going to get back to you and um, talk and explain and, and, and say that. So, anybody who wants to, um, it's not just for people that buy code, it could be product people. Yeah. I mean, it could be even like an educator, like you saw on the um, thing that we did uh, with the Otan area. So, um, everyone could be helpful some way. Thank you for asking. Mm -hmm. And if this is um, posted in Facebook or something, then we can put a link too. Definitely, definitely, we'll do that. Any last question, I think? Yes? Yeah. Your name and... Okay. Um, my question is, do you have any tips uh, for finding good co-founders? And what do you see mm -hmm. among some of the other founders you've seen in the, the relationship? What's important to keep in mind? <laughs> so, Pamela, any tip to finding good co-founders? Wow. It's, um, <laughs> it's, it's really interesting because, you know, it's not trivial, but so many startups fail because of disagreement between the founders. Um, and when you find the right person, you got to make sure it's the right match. Um, I started teaching in uh, Rachman University uh, entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. and we just had a class about team and how to build the right team. And uh, we spoke kind of for three things. We spoke about skills, that you want to have complementary skills with each other. And uh, we spoke about um, like work habits, and we also spoke about values. Uh, because let's say there are a few great values that you want to align, but you also want to prioritize them. So let's say... Um, for me, uh, transparency is a, is a top value, uh, but for Leon, uh, working fast or being more efficient is uh, the top value. Both of them are great values, but you can see how they can uh, conflict with each other and that can cause conflict. So my tip is when you have founders, don't talk, just talk about the business, but talk about, a, about your values, uh, spend a lot of time together, talk about your skills, talk about the things that you don't do well. 
where to find them specifically. There are events like this, there are meetups. Um, I don't know about something that's more I know Noah uh, from the next exit is trying to make some matches on her um, on her free time. And um, you just got to do more diligence, a lot of more due diligence on the person you want to connect with because you're going to spend a lot of time with her and you're going to um, get into a lot of conflicts. Um, I also see some entrepreneurs put in um, um, an assistance to make sure um, it works and um, and there's a place where you can talk about things, maybe like a weekly for just the founders. Maybe a uh, great company that I quack, they go once a quarter. Uh, no name, no, it's a good thing, so it's a good thing. So I'm, I'm going them there. I love their idea. They go all four founders and plus their spouses, they go on a weekend together. Um, so I think that's great because uh, it's building them and it's strengthening the connections between each other and between the families. Um, um, I know there's a lot of uh, kind of couples therapy, but for founders, but founders therapy and places you can. Yeah, why yeah. <laughs> And how to, just you got to be aware that um, there's a very high uh, failure chances because of conflict between founders and uh, think about it before and do a lot of due diligence before and try to put in place mechanisms to avoid that. Great points, very good points. Anybody else wants to ask a last question? Yes, or two last questions? Yeah. Well, um, what was the most surprising uh, things you learned throughout your investment? Omer, what were the most surprising things or lessons you learned throughout your investments? Hmm. I want to say that there are no surprises, really. <laughs> um, maybe to listen more to my intuition. Um, that if something felt wrong in the beginning and I can try to make excuses for that, it usually is not okay. Um, I don't have any other big surprise that I can talk about, that I can think of. And if I think of, I'll come back to you, I'll find you. <laughs> I'll find you. We had, yeah, in the back. What inspired you to go to college in America? So I actually didn't go to college in America. I went to Tel Aviv University. I did my undergrad here. I did uh, law, accounting, and economics. And um, I went to law school knowing I don't want to be a lawyer. I just felt it's a good um, profession um, to have when you want to do business. If you ask me now, if I were 20 year old now, I would have um, gone to computer science. Because I think now, especially if you want to be in technology, mm -hmm. it's a better uh, language and a better skill than um, law, but I gotta say it is helpful. My, if you're curious, my uh, fallback position, my fallback was uh, pastry, being a pastry chef. Mm. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so the world is saved from, uh, from, a, from a singer and a pastry chef. <laughs> Thankfully, I got into law school. Um, several years later, I did my graduate degree in the US, and um, I think I did an MBA, uh, which is kind of a very practical degree, uh, not just the acad academic. Uh, in which the people you do it with is extremely important. I want to be part of a global community um, and, and, and experience uh, learning the, the graduate degree abroad. And I applied to a few schools and I got into Stanford and I was like, wow, they made a mistake. I got to go <laughs> before they find out about it. Uh, and I had amazing, amazing two years and um, learned a lot there and have friends for life. Um, and I'm very thrilled about the experience. I have to say that your energies are contagious. It's so clear to see that you're passionate about what you're doing and that you're enjoying it. And you've been so open here and gave such an amazing tip. So first of all, please, a round of applause. Well deserved it. Thank you, thank you for inviting me. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, and before we finish, you know, you were so kind to, um, to share. It. Oh, Woody. Yeah, he said that we're finishing. That oh, well, just a f just we have a few more minutes. Um, you were so kind to to celebrate in Bal's birthday. It's very much deserved. But um, you know, we, we we did some research online and we saw that you had a very uh, nice birthday a few months ago. And someone gave you a very interesting gift, and we want to share with everybody the gift that you gave. You may know what I'm talking about, but if not, Shacha will will make it. Yeah, Shacha. It's like uh, the suspense. <laughs> to pin. It's on the screen. It's on the screen? Ooh. Yeah. Oh, that's the play. Well, you guys, I'm going to 
got to tell the story. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Right. Story. I'll tell the story. <laughs> so, um, wait, leave you some news. Yeah, before you start. Yeah, it's, it's good. So, um, I have a good friend who was actually, uh, this is creativity. He was an entrepreneur. He sold the startup, the successful ah, startup. Oh, yeah, he sold the successful okay. startup to Facebook called Red Kicks. And uh, then decided once he finished his time there that his passion is actually music. And he decided to um, leave high tech, maybe do some investments in music now. He's your co host of the. We did a, yeah, we did a little show during COVID of, uh, like, uh, uh, online. Uh, but he's now working in the music industry. He has um, a place called Session 42, it's a production company. And he got all our friends from the US together for my birthday. It was a round birthday. I'll let you guess which one. Doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> and they actually wrote a song uh, for me for my birthday, and the gift is that all the royalties from the song will actually go to nonprofits of my choice. Woo. Now, I, I don't know, so actually we're creating value now, right? We're going to watch it, and it's going to be like 10 cents exactly. of donation to a nonprofit. And put the link in the... Put the links, everybody can listen again and again. We'll share the link. money for nonprofits when you watch the movie. I was hoping it's gonna be like, what is that? Oh, it's gonna be like in a movie, and then we're gonna make millions of pounds. And that didn't happen. <laughs> Yes. Starting at start of grind, you know. So, guys, let's let's do let's enjoy the song and even contribute. <laughs> Thank you. And thank you guys for being an amazing audience. Thank you. See you next time.